If you're looking to sponsor the Anything Goes podcast and have your business promoted on this show, you can contact sponsor anything goes at outlook.com or you can call 07584 650 203 for more information. Make sure you click the link to subscribe to my YouTube channel and also click the notifications button to be notified for when my next podcast goes live. You can also follow me on my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest is. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Thank you. We're on. Today's guest, we've got the London legend, Dave Courtney. How are we, brother? We're very well, sir. How are you? Are you good? Yeah, yeah, really good, thanks. First of all, thanks for letting us into the castle. It's it's some place. We've got a room full of guns and knives. We've got one room full of books. We've got jacuzzis. Where'd it's, you come from? Where you come from? I thought you'd have been used to a room full of guns. <laughs> I was just trying to do it. I mean, you feel at home. I just sprinkled them about liberally. Uh, I think um, because you've did so many films and wrote so many books... Friends with the craze, stuff like that. I think the majority of people know your story. Yeah, um, yeah But it'd be good to try and dig a bit deeper and go back to the start and understand your life a bit more. Well, you, I'm afraid that's your skills as a as an interviewee, mm -hmm. interviewer. Mm -hmm. Try and drag it out of me because I very much listen to all my old um, uh, interviews and they all sound exactly the same. I've been saying the same thing for 30 years. But if I'm not asking anything different, I can't say... Mm -hmm. Nothing different. They talked to me about the Cray Twin in that era. It's very hard for me to uh, elaborate on something that's not happening no more. I can only tell you what it... Yeah, the past stories. Know, yeah. Where did you grow up, Dave? Um, in my heart, I didn't really grow up. I'm still a child, but I grew up in South London, um, Bermondsey and Forest Hill. Beautiful parents, good God-fearing cub and scout leaders, one brother, one sister. We weren't poor. I wasn't on the breadline. Nice house, enjoyed school. Um, I just found that entertaining people, making people laugh was my way forward. That was my gift. And um, being an entertainer, being a court jester in any situation you have in life, I have found that it is the best gift I could possibly have had. Yeah, making someone laugh is a gift. You can laugh someone into bed. You can laugh a jury into going not guilty. If you can actually... Um, make your mum laugh by the time she's there, just smacking your ass in that bit, you get a lighter smack. Yeah. Right? Making people mm -hmm. laugh was my gift. So at school, I learned it, which turned me into like a, a natural leader material, really. Yeah, being able to use your tongue better and talk and make light of a situation where normally another one will go, do, do him. Yeah, it, it, it turned me into that. You've Well, that must have clearly worked at court because you've been... Not proven in over 20 occasions. That's right, yeah. How? Forgive me if I get a, a semi hard on when you're saying that. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did that happen? How, how did that happen? Well, the truth is, is ingenuity, good friends, and um, the law being what it was, made it possible for people to get away with things then, which is why they slowly, over 20 years, changed it. They brought out, um, they can recharge you. Now, you know, you could. You could uh, get charged for the same thing twice. Is that double jeopardy kind of thing? Yeah, they can do the whole double jeopardy thing. But um, now there's the internet. I'm afraid there is no more getting not guilty because a simple thing as this, if you had just had an accident in your car and you said to your mate, do us a favour, say you witnessed that for me. He'd say he's witnessed it and you get your insurance money. Or if you went to court and the copper said, I saw him shoot someone and you went, no, I was with 20 people. I heard a bang and they, and we run over there. I picked up the gun and then you come and it looks like I shot him. He can say he shot me. If I've got 20 people to go court for me as a witness and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and they're not all looking thugs, they're a couple of firemen, sergeant major in the TA. If I've got 20 people go to court and say you never done it, the first law in the courtroom is if there is an element of doubt, you have to be found not guilty. Right, the British legal system can be guilty of letting an innocent man get away, 
but it can't be guilty of locking an innocent man up. So if there's an element of doubt, you can get not guilty. So if you've got 20 people to turn up and say, he was with me, that's element of doubt. But you can't do that anymore because they now go on your Facebook and they go, all of your witnesses are your fucking best friends. Every single witness you've got in this court case, I've just looked at Facebook, they're all your best mates, so not one of them count. What was your first ever crime? Uh, it's what, it's what, it's what um, the situation arises here where it's what I actually thought or believed was a crime at the time. Yeah, I just thought I was having a giggle. I just thought I was having a laugh and forget what the expense was if it went wrong, if I got nicked or right. But I was the first to climb in the windows, open the doors, nick the cars, drive the cars, hide the stuff, make the... Uh, do a diversion for the shoplifters. I was up for all of that. So as soon as I could walk or talk what other people were considering crime, I was considering enjoying myself and having a laugh. Was that just to get a buzz? Really just to get a buzz. Plus I found I had an awful lot more money than everybody else because I was hanging around with bigger people that were doing the nicking the cars and breaking in the shops. I was hanging around with them because I was being a bit funny, a bit daring and up for the laugh, which made me look brave, I suppose. How did that come about then? Because you're clearly raised in a good household with your mum and dad. Because I, I enjoyed the um, the court jester thing, the entertaining, the having a captive audience. Even prison worked bad for me. I had 600 people to make laugh all day and I wanted to laugh because they were bored. Mm -hmm. Yeah, entertainment. And and, and um, that's how I really first got into it, nicking cars and all that. You know, I was a late starter with the fighting. I didn't realise that until I was about 15, 16. Because a lot of people said you didn't carry a gun. It was more a knuckle duster. I, I still do carry a knuckle duster. Yeah, 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 24-7. I wouldn't even hit my old woman without one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so you still carry a knuckle duster 24-7 um, yes, yeah. yeah what's the story with did you rob a post office but did you have your dog with you and you were on a moped and you were driving a moped with dragging the dog along no 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 you know, you, you got, you got two stories mixed up yeah is it the knuckle duster thing is this you should not carry the weapon that you are not prepared to do the bird for right? what I mean by that is if you are someone that chooses to carry a knife out with you, and there's a lot of people out there today in, in, a, in an assortment of different jobs that have to carry a weapon, yeah? Doormen, soldiers, prison officers, police, you know, they you can even buy, you know, you need to carry a weapon. And if you actually pull out a knife and go, boom, to pull the knife and save your life, forget that situation. What's most probably going to happen is you're going to have to pull it out unexpectedly. While you're going down the shops with your wife and kid in the car, hit someone up the arse in his new car. If he jumps out of his car, open your door and start smacking you in the mouth in your car. If you had a knife in your pocket, you would go and stab him in the middle of the ice street for murder. Or if someone trod on your foot in Sainsbury's and you had a corn operation, or you trod on his foot and he jumped on you and started smashing you in the head with a tin of beans, you would pull out your knife and stab him and kill him for this because he trod on your foot. So don't carry the, carry something that don't kill someone for fuck's sake. That's all I'm saying. Do you think it's a coward's way out? I don't so, think it's a coward's way out. No, I think it's a, it's just a sign of the times, yeah? Years ago, they used to bottle people. Hundreds of years before that, they had the two broom handles with a chain in the middle. And now it's knives, and it was gas, and then it's acid, and then it's guns, and you know, it's, it's, it's all changing. But the Eastern Bloc people in this country, influx into this country has upped the level of violence. Everyone's on a natural, we're all carrying a chiv now, as they do. And um, I'm afraid that doesn't help you win a fight. You, know, you don't just stab someone and they stop hitting you. You actually, a, a stab feels like an half-decent punch. You have to go to make him stop. Right? Do you think people should be sorting rivalries then between street fights, square goes? Fighting each other it's more. It's not our thing. It's a completely different world out there than me and you. We've got no think in it. There's no one any control now whatsoever over what's going to happen to the youth. It's spiralling out. It's going to get an awful, awful lot worse. The police are aware of it and can't want they're rubbing their hands with it, really. There's all that about we're trying to stop it. If they wanted to stop it, they could. Mm -hmm. Well, any life of crime is bad, but it is bad. back in the day, there was a lot more respect with the older gangsters. There was a lot more. Uh, there was, I'm afraid, I'm, I have a sick, this sounds to a general public, but there was um, 
a unity among naughty men. You couldn't actually go and spread and talk to everyone else that weren't in your job. Your wife's couldn't have it with everyone else's wife because of what you did as a job. And it almost had an air of, dare I say, respectability or class if you was a bank robber or a villain, almost. Yeah, you was prepared to risk going to prison to go out and earn the money for your kids to eat. That kind of attitude. And you could almost stand up in school and say, my dad's a bank robber. Right? The same thing today is you can't stand up and go, my dad's a drug dealer. That's a different, it don't cut it, yeah? As much as, much as the, the rewards are far more superior than anything any of us have ever owned, it don't cut it. A load of criminals in them days would have been a safe cracker, an arm robber, a hijacker, a, you know, whatever, a bank robber. Now you just got drugged, a narc- narcotic dealers, shotters, smugglers, and it's a different... Um, it's too much money to keep a lot of morals and honesty about it. Then you add walls have ears, loose licks sink, sh- sink ships, uh, a spy is more dangerous than a thousand men, that was no comment, no comment. That was the order of the day. England had just come out of a war and we had a bulldog reputation. If you could pull our fingernails out, we wouldn't tell you it was England. And if you had a job at the time as a policeman, you had a terrible job because no one ever grasped anyone. We have war, war morals. No one say nothing. Well, then they've learned after that. They spent the next 40 years twisting the whole country's head, going that grassing people up is good, advertising it on every single television station, primetime telly, and there's grass lines in every newspaper you get. Ring up someone if you know they've had a drink and driving. Ring up if he's got a job. Ring up if they've had a drink. and Yeah, yeah ring up for guns and drugs. You know, they've in, they introduced the grassing on your, on your mum and dad now. They teach kids a telephone number to go to school and grass up your mum and daddy if they give you a smack. They say to a kid, come in, ring your mum and, and we'll put your mum and dad in prison and get you a nice foster home. Seven seven nine three three two two one. Come and grass up your mum and dad. Somewhere down the line, that's got to come back and kick you in the bollocks. They've turned a nation of bulldoggy people into that, that we would just run around and stab people. When did you start getting all the fame and attention? Because you're one of the most London... One, one, uh, one night. What happened? I, was running a big security company, ticking over just fucking beautiful, maybe the biggest security company in Great Britain at the time. Raven had first come in. Everyone was acid. I had about eight, 900 people working for me. I was having odd dealings with the craze because they had other friends out there and it was dealing things that was going on in the clubs that I was working. I'd been to see them. I was a bit impressed. I became in awe, um, wrongly, and looked after them and didn't mind them being associated with me or me being associated with them. And the way my life was going at the time, I didn't mind the association with them. Um, Ronnie Cray died. The, the, the funeral pilot got a death, a death threat. They said, we're not all Cray twin fans. We're going to come down there and burn it down. The funeral pilot is in there. They rung Reg. Reg rung me. I had to sleep in the funeral pilot for two weeks. And then at the end of that, he went, I need you to do the security. So after they'd done the security for the Cray twin funeral, in the next morning... I was on the headlines of heir to the fucking throne, celebrity gangster. Um, that weren't what I'd got to sign in for. I was running a set of doormen. It was like a, it was like a, a job centre for naughty men on Friday and Saturday night when I was at work. The rest of the week they had no work, so you could get them to give the neighbour a smack in the mouth, throw the squatters out, go and get your car repossessed. You know, there was the big muscly old lumps all working on the door and I was like a job centre for them. Well, they all got the crater in funeral. Up till that minute, criminals are supposed to collar up in the shadows, no pictures, no comment, drive a little low-key car. Right? And right from that minute, they had to be going, da hello, interviews, chats, freedom in the press. I'm on telly, here I am. And I got the best 180-odd men I could find to do that funeral, which was three, three quarters of a million people. And I've got to be honest, when they all met in my garden, 180 of what I considered the best ones I know, Mr. Glasgow, Mr. Edinburgh, Mr. Manchester, oh, the, everyone I know, my, oh, fuck the funeral, I want to go and invade Iraq. I was like, look at that. Did that give you power? Um, it, oh, well, I've got the power anyway, but I hadn't seen it before me that I could touch. Mm-hmm. You know, the power comes with your telephone. Everyone's a cunt apart from their phone. Because you, fa- you, you yeah. can kick fuck out of me, but if you let me get to my phone, mate, mm-hmm. I'll fuck you. Mm-hmm. Whatever. So, so clearly got a lot of contacts still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the police, after that day, saw that. And although they understood about um, organised crime, that was the first time in this country they had seen organised crime to such a volume. 
And one, one criminal had ordered all of England's Premier Division criminals, all their own criminal CV, 200 of them nearly, all to come to London to celebrate the death of a criminal. You know, a load of these people hated each other. They wanted to shoot each other. But on that day, you know, all arranged by one other criminal. Yeah. Well, that was their, their first thing of criminal organised crime. And they just, from that minute, they went, fuck, we, you know, you can't have an army in England apart from the army. Yeah. yeah. So they just went out to shut me down and that altered my whole life. They stopped every television thing I was on, stopped me writing for the magazines, changed the law legally that you now can't glamorise crime. Right? The whole whole country was going through a the freedom of the press and everyone was liking what us little boys had to say. Not that we're right or we're glamorising crime, but we made it sound entertaining. And and I and I've got Reggie Cray, regular parts in magazines, Charlie B- Bronson. Myself, me, Freddie Foreman, Lenny, and um, Tony Lambriano was working for Pink Shirts, modelling. Yeah. It all went stupid. Everyone loved their books. The films, yeah. it was like a gangster chic, and mm-hmm. the freedom of the press was celebritising us. They and they, like just, that. Uh, they didn't like that. No, mm-hmm. they just put a stop on it that no one, like, like Gary Bush will say to me now, Dave, with your new book, don't give it to me to be a critic because by law, I'm now not allowed to say. Mm-hmm. Dave's book's good because that's yeah. glamorising crime. Virgin can publish my book, but they can't put a poster up saying Dave's got a new book out because the poster is glamorising crime. Even if it says fiction or... Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So how can... I always believe anybody can change, Dave. I always believe so them. I believe you. Listen, look at me. I'm not yeah. glamorising crime. So how can people better their life or change if, if they're trying to make a, I'll tell you an why. honest I'll living? I'll tell you why. They're trying to make it, um, well, and rightly so, look like crime don't pay. Which is true. And you can't glamorise crime, which is 100% true. Mm-hmm. I say that. It might it might pay for the minute you're getting away with it, but you all get caught. Cool. It'll pay you while you're sitting in a soft top BM with a little bird in a flat you just bought in Marbella. I then try and tell you crime don't pay is hard. But talk to you in three years' time when you're sitting inside for like 23 years. And your best friend's reading your book. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, mm-hmm. Then you realise it don't and you all get caught. Cool. Mm-hmm. Right, I'm afraid. How was Charlie, Charles Bronson? Uh, he's a lovely guy. He's just. Were you at his wedding? Yeah, I've done his wedding at my pub, both of his weddings at my pub. I've uh, been to see him um, a few times. We had a little iffy wear meeting when we first met. We didn't really get on. But um, I'm afraid the crime there with Charles Bronson, I'm afraid, is they are now genuinely entitled to say, we can't let him out, he's mad. Right? Because anyone that done 27 years in solitary confinement would be. Cuckoo, whoever, mm-hmm. the Pope, me, you, Mother Teresa. Anybody. Right. And so they're within their rights now to say, of all the naughty things he'd done in prison, using him as a deterrent, this is what we're going to do to you if you mess about in prison. You're never, ever, ever coming home. Right? You're never coming home. He's mad. And all these people that are going free Charlie Bronson, would you like him living next door to you? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, he might be great. Saturday... Odd for no reason at all, and it's not, you know. And their crime is this: he wasn't mad when he went in. Mm-hmm. So that's their crime. They're not wrong in saying he can't come out now. And all these people are going, "Well, he ain't murdering anyone. He ain't, but he's is took hostages. It would go, he'd smash yeah. everyone. You know, like he's done some nutty old things. I love him. I love him, but he can he can see his own plight that he's made there. Has he potentially, if he did get out, would kill someone? I don't know if you sit out or you sit there thinking of killing someone, but he's so strong and and and, and eggshell ready to snap. Yeah, mm-hmm. he could. You know, I, mean, I don't want to be the one that goes, don't give him parole. But um, yeah, their their crime is just they are right in saying he shouldn't come home, and I know he ain't killed no one, but they're wrong and he weren't mad when he went in. They actually mm-hmm. made him like this. Break him mentally. Yeah, of course they do. Yeah, that's what they do though if you're causing of they do. harm in there. I know you love the bare knuckle boxing and the fighting and you have your events. How's how's that for you? Um, Now I've had to take a very, very back seat in my old way of life. I like to keep my hand in with as much of the interesting stuff as I can. I loved the boxing events. They were, they were a boxing event Plus, they were a meet and greet place for all the naughty men to meet. From that, no one ever, I can't remember what I've done, planned to meet down there, but all the naughty chaps met at the boxing. It just attracts a certain t- 
type of person, I think. And um, I used to have a mirror out the, out the side in, in the bowels of hay. That's where I took the first world championship title between England and America, which is in that back garden with the bowels of hay. It's now gone on to the, the B-Bad boxing promotion. There's another one on Saturday now. It's now at the O2. So it's gone from in the back of Dave Courtney's garden, mm -hmm. hidden under bowels of hay, to it's now being filmed at the O2 by Sky. And now they got away with it is they just now wrap a little wrap of bandage round your yeah. knuckle. So it isn't bare knuckle no more, mm -hmm. but it's still the most gladiatorial full combat sport that there is at the moment in this country with all of the health and safety thing going on. It's you know, and it's and ask, ask Julius Caesar. We all like to watch a good scrap. Mm -hmm. Does that turn you on watching people fighting? No, uh, there was a time when at the time when it did, it made me feel virile, but at the moment now I'm sixty. <laughs> I just sit and watch it and get very jealous that I can't fucking do it anymore. How was um because you're help but you listen, you're off, you're looking great by the way for sixty. Thank you very much, yeah. But you had a heart attack last well, I year. I didn't have a heart attack. I didn't mm. have a heart attack. When you get to sixty, you've got to go to the doctors and they give you an MOT. Just check you all over. And then when they're doing it, they went, You've got a leaking heart valve, Mr. Courtney. And because I'm a dickhead. Sorry, just, Viagra, you've been taking <laughs> Yeah, all these bundles of it. Still am, right? Still am. I'm a man with a dungeon at the bottom of my garden. What do you think I'm here? What do you think I'm here? I went in there, he said, you need a new valve. It's nothing urgent. He went, um, we don't know how long that's been leaking. Mm -hmm. It could have been leaking for 40 years, or it could have just happened, but it would make you prone to an heart attack. So somewhere down the line, we're going to fit you in for a non-urgent appointment to get that mended. I went, yeah, cool. And then I've, I've said, to, said to the people, I'm getting this thing put in my heart. And everyone's going to me, oh, you're getting um, a stent, a stent, this, stent, there. And I've ended up truly with my hand on my heart. I thought I was getting a stent. I, that's really what I thought. And a stent is something you go in in the morning, they stick it in a vein in your bollocks, and they stick it up to your heart, and you're out in the afternoon. I thought it was that until I went in and I had to sign this certificate if I die. And what are you talking about? <laughs> you're in here for the week. And then it was a. Uh, I was having open heart surgery, like Shit. breaking all my ribs, cut my best breastplate in half, take my heart out, cut a lump out of it, put a pig's bit of a heart on there, then put it back in you, sew it all back together and say, that's it. And I was like, wow. You know, and I really weren't ready for that. And I had a little bit of um, rheumatoid arthritis kicked into me and um, I'll give someone a clump and his tooth stuck in my hand and the poison got into my bone marrow and the poison was going around my body in my bone marrow and they thought it was in my blood. So they give me blood transfusions. I was in hospital for five weeks, but it was not time to find out what it was. Um, I got it. it. Yeah, and then so getting better from an heart attack, that is that's hard work. It really hurts. It is really, that really hurts. Um, try to slow you down then? Has it slowed you yeah, down? It slowed me down, yeah, because what it made me do is I've ended up sitting in front of the city for half a year Watching Netflix, which I think is a new invention, ain't that fantastic? <laughs> I've never, I could never understand, I could never understand watching Netflix and eating. And I went up to 19 and three quarter stone. Right? Couldn't get fit again because I'm now huge. I ain't got the willpower to do it. So I really have, was not running on the full tank for oh. about a year and a half. A bit of depression there as well. Uh, as much as I hate to, it's the first time I've ever said this out of my front room. Mm hmm. Yes, I think I had depression, but I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I, I think I did. Yeah. yeah. What with my son was murdered. Yeah. You know, I'm not very happy about being single. The wife, I loved her, you know, and oh, a, lot, a lot of things. Yeah. I got off to blame for it. I got ill. I've had a fucking heart attack. You know, fuck. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sitting there, worries me. But um, one little bath when I stood up, looked in the mirror, big full left mirror that made me cry and went, oh, what have I done? Mm -hmm. huh? uh, couldn't even reach me, cock, let alone have a wank, you know what I mean? It was a fucking joke. Mm -hmm. So then I've, I've locked myself up in this health farm, just gone, that's most really the most severe health farm in Great Britain, um, and they feed you nothing. And they're up in the morning, you've got the boot camp, the runs, the Zumba, the yoga for five weeks, and I've come back, I've done two and a half stone, and I feel brilliant. Yeah, good. Because again. you're just back from a run there. I think that shows more about your character, Dave, because because you are a life and soul of the party, because you are a big fucking personality, the fact that you've went through all that trauma as well and it's affected you and you probably didn't realise it because you've probably been too proud to say, 
okay, wait a minute, I've been sitting here for six months watching Netflix, but but you're doing something about it, so it takes respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? To make the changes. My, my well-being, I'm afraid, my state of mind and my own personal well-being, most of the time I'd, I'm, I'll get off on it or I don't mind, but it affects an awful lot of other people. Mm-hmm. My well-being, nothing to do with him, whether I'm looking good, whether I'm well, whether I'm looking affluent, whether business is good, affects an awful lot of other hundreds of families all over the country, whether Dave's all right or Dave's not all right. I'm their boss, I'm not ever, you know, they work through me, the people they know are all down through me, they're they're associated as mine. You understand what I mean? So in my own little jigsaw puzzle of a world I've got in my head, everyone's got their own little bit, it's like a, An ulterior uh, yeah. masons. Yeah. All of mine look after the each one. I don't just mm. know naughty people. The naughty people in my phone book are five pages, but I can get you a moody mortgage, a washing machine repaired, someone to cut your mm. grass, a cheap holiday, yeah. uh, someone's villa they're not using. Is that why they call you the yellow, yellow pages? pages? The yellow pages, the yellow mm. one, yes. It's not me, it's my phone. If I can ring somebody up to shoot you for nothing more than a bang on the head, you're in the gang, I'm tougher than you, aren't I? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's what it is today, it's the telephone. Because mm-hmm. as well, we'll touch on, because you do a lot for charity, you open up your place and your house and have barbecues and raise money for people with autism, yeah. kids with autism. Yeah. I've seen that in the papers and stuff, and you do good things. Well, I don't actually do it for the publicity of it, because if I do get the publicity mm-hmm. for it, I put myself under fire of people going, oh, he's only doing it. So I don't actually do it, mm-hmm. I do it for genuine... Reasons is people in my family with autism. I most probably have got and have had ADHD all my life, so I support that. Mm-hmm. You understand what I mean? Yeah. Victim support unit, people have come out of prison and it's all going a bit boss eyed for them. I'll help that. Mm-hmm. But what good is me trying to help Oxfam or. Big charities? Yeah, yeah, something like that. I could, at least that one I can help. I can go around the prisons, mm-hmm. talk to them. Mm-hmm. You know, I can try and. Say in in, a, in a, an on-road way, crime don't fucking yeah. pay, mate. It's because of your character. If you did bad, they'd think you were glorifying it. If you did good, do you think yeah, you were yeah, glorifying it? Yeah, absolutely. We made a record 12 years ago, me, Freddie Foreman, uh, Frankie Fraser, Joe Paul, Ronnie Biggs, made a million quid. And we give it to Help a London Child. And Help a London Child said, yeah, we want it, of course you want it. Thank you very much on that. But we cannot be seen publicly saying thank you to people like yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So give it to these other charities and it'll filter through to us, but we can't be seen saying thank you to you. And we made it with a record with Tricky, Massive Attack. Yeah, it's called The Product of the Environment. It's a blinding record and we all put a little tune on it. Yeah. And they, uh, you know, it's, it's awful. It's, it's... Yeah, it's because anything in life, if you do good, you feel good. Right, and my house is now they're driving past looking at it going, I'm glamorising crime. I'm making all the kids want to be a gangster. And I'm like, I ain't. You're not beating a Sherlock Holmes policeman no more. You're trying to beat technology, mate. None mm-hmm. of us can do it. The cameras, the phones, the car, the sat nav, the satellite. Stop. Mm-hmm. Don't be a criminal. Don't do it. How are you, Dave, when the cameras and that off? Are you, do you feel as if you have to be in character all the time? No, is that you're just character. This is actually it. Mm-hmm. It's just yeah, your because they, yeah, yeah, it's just here. Because I've been surrounded by cameras a lot of my time, I'm afraid, not woe is me, but I'm afraid I was the forerunner in the crime world where right up until one day, the unwritten rule book was no comment, no pictures, have your collar up, whispers, down a little alley, keep a low coffee. I was at the era when criminals were going... Dun-dun. You yeah. understand what I mean? Like getting a magazine articles and they wanted to do documentaries about you and I can't do any of them if I'm still active. So I had to retire from crime the day I'd done the, the Grey Twin funeral is the day I retired because after that, I couldn't do anything wrong. One, the more famous you get for being a criminal, the less criminal you can be. Yeah, the more heat you bring on everybody right, else. I couldn't get out of my car after that and just bang the geezer in the mm-hmm. car behind because everyone in the street would go, it was Dave Courtney, I know him. It's a crazy bloke. bloke. Mm-hmm. I'm fucked. Yeah. How was people treating you? Because in the under- underworld, people was trying to keep their nose out of papers and press and draw attention. How did other people treat you? Was there jealousy? Was there uh, hatred? Yeah, of course, there's a lot of professional jealousy. Plus, a lot of people that aren't retired 
wanted the glory of being a gangster but can't because they are a gangster. Thought I weren't deserving the whole heir to the throne thing, which I weren't clambering for. I've never said I'm a fucking super gangster. I've never said I'm a great fighter. I've never said I was rich. I've never said I'm a celebrity. Never. No, in any book, never. Mm. I never robbed the bank, uh, train, never been done the, you know, beat Danny McClellan. Never. But I'm good at doing this. Yeah. And at the turn of the millennium, the gangsters weren't down the little alley with a collar turned up. They'd all retired. I can only walk around going, look at me, now I'm doing fuck all. Now I've got big paintings of myself on the side of my house and flags up. I can assure you, I ain't doing nothing in here. Mm-hmm. How's Lenny McLean? Yeah, Lenny McLean was cool. I was in prison with him when he'd done the murder. Uh, he was in my first documentary. I've been on a few boxing shows with him. Yeah, he's cool. They're all really cool. What happened was the Premier Division naughty men, the Freddie Foremans, the Ronnie Reggie, Charlie Cray, the Ronnie Biggses, they all knew that I was better at doing in front of camera than they were. Because they've had their whole life going there, but now they have to be expected to go, right, let's sell ourselves. Dave is the best one for that. So they wrapped me up in cotton wool and sent me out to try and sell them, you know, to get their book deals, get their film deal, get all that, because they weren't used to it. Not that I was the biggest gangster, it's just I was the best at that bit. Mm. Yeah. yeah, networking. Networking. If Lenny McLean's your mate, why do you want to have a fight? Get Lenny McLean to do it. He's the best at that. Mm-hmm. So, and the rest of the world didn't know that. The rest of the world thought I was out clam- clambering for get a load of me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who's the, the gangsters? The, the gangsters yeah. were loving me for it. Who's the toughest man you've ever been surrounded with? Um, it's all different people, I'm afraid, in different situations. The best nightclub doorman fighter I've ever seen was Lenny McLean. Yeah. yeah? You know, you're born for certain things. Usain Bolt, born to run, Muhammad Ali, born to box. Yeah? Lenny McLean was born to stand in doorways and fight groups of men. Because he made it famous when Dorman got famous, individuals, because there was every Saturday you had football violence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, One Saturday, what well, two Saturdays a month, London got 20,000 Liverpool supporters for Saturday night playing Arsenal, 20,000 Man United supporters playing Tottenham, 20,000 Leeds supporters playing Chelsea, 20,000 Newcastle supporters, all down in London for the night. So the little doorman in the London West End had 100,000 Northerners to compete with one night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there were fights. There were no radios, no, you know, trouble exit number five. You actually went, help me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Dorman had the sleeves ripped off their sheepskins and looked like yeah. Dorman, you know. And 30 blokes were standing at the bar all with a chip having a bit of Charlie and the governor went for him out. You had jobs then. Mm-hmm. That it was a different kind of Dorman and he loved it. Loved pain, loved the taste of blood, went to work with a broken collarbone, a broken nose and a tooth knocked out. His arm in a sling on a Friday and went to work on a Saturday and still no one to fight a gun. <laughs> right? So how's the, the police treating you now? Well, the police treat me now, I'm afraid, is I'm still um, target number one because it's not. I know I'm not active, but I make crime look like a, like a careers option. Mm-hmm. You know, the house, the clothes, the cockiness, the amount of people want me on telly and want to listen to what I say. But I'm, t- I'm, I'm saying don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm actually saying no, but I, I still get my ass bugged. We're still followed. They still, if I have a, an audience with somewhere, they go to the place and went, listen, if you have Dave Courtney and his mates turning up to your premises, you won't have a license for a telly. So cancel it. You know, they go to the film directors and go, I don't want them in the film. Still? Go, yes, it's still up till last week. They go to the recording studio and say, if you have Courtney on this album, it's going to be looked at as a criminally organised, is it criminal money that's done it? You know, it's, yeah, it's mental, crazy. it's mental. So you say as well for the, was it the M20 or M25 where you said that somebody tried to murder you? On the A2. A2. Well, I was taking the police to court. I got nicked with the police, didn't I? I got, well, I've paid policemen all my life. Everyone knows that. Everyone I know knows that. And if Ronnie and Reggie, Charlie Cray and all them Ronnie big thing on the, I'm not a grass. I'm not worried if some cunt is that, but a professional criminal does pay policemen. I'm sorry, right, if you're clever. And when he got caught, he went, no, he's not paying me. I'm paying Dave. Had that been believed, it would have got me shot. Mm-hmm. 
Right? He had no proof of it, but he needed an excuse. He's been caught. He couldn't go, yes, I've been bought and paid for by Dave Courtney and his boys for the last 15 years because there'd have to be a load of retrials, compensation, you know. So the best they can get out of this now is they've got a copper now nicked. Right? I'm gonna, it's going to come out that Dave Courtney's put a copper in prison, blah, 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 blah. I taped the copper. I bugged him. Mm-hmm. And when he actually said, no, I'm paying Dave, I've got the tape. So he couldn't, couldn't, I couldn't lose the case. But then he went not guilty. And I was wondering, why is he going not guilty? And what they did is they went, right, um, damage limitation. Courtney's going to put you in prison anyway. So he either comes out looking like a hero for doing it, or we could pretend that we believe you, say Courtney might be a grass for eight months, and that'll get some um, Chinese whispers going, right? And on the day the court case starts, you can change your plea to guilty, and if he ain't shot by then, it will have stopped all that. Oh, ain't Dave a funny bloke? He's running for mayor and everything. I had a mayor thing, and they did that. They genuinely said they believed him. Right, I've got a day I want to call, which I want to call dressed as a court jester. All of my friends, like, what are you doing? I shouldn't be here. What are you? I, bu- I bugged him. You've heard it. You've got the tape, and you're still taking me a call and putting that in the paper, and it was you, and then. After the court case finished, I then went to the High Court of Justice and brought out a, a summons. I paid 380 quid for it with me and Bill Murray, and it was on Sky TV, and nicked the police for attempted murder because I said, I will accept any excuse in the world of why you put it in the paper that I was a grass. After you had the tape of me bugging him, after you had I do prove it, I'm saying that you put that in the paper saying that about me to try and get me killed but I will accept any other excuse otherwise. And I've took it out. It's a, I've took it out. I've summoned them, right? Any excuse of why you put out the paper, I'm saying you tried to get me killed, right? Before I got out all the other fucking jobs he'd done, right? I'm saying that. But I'll accept any excuse. And they didn't know what to fucking do about it, and they run me over on the motorway at 12 at night. Someone done a pit manoeuvre on me on the A2, right? Do you know anyone that would kill someone? Of all the ways to kill you, mate, I'd think of a million before I went, I'll let you while you're doing under mile an hour on the A2, which is all cameraed off, yeah, and do a pit manoeuvre. That's their one. They make programmes about it. They do that. And then they done it to me. I didn't die. I come out of the coma in five weeks. So I went, right, get the cameras. I'll show you who done it. And they went, it's the only day in its history that the A2 weren't cameraed that night. And behind me, just so, was, and go and check all this out, goggle it, was a unmarked police car that saw all of the accident that I had, took the 13 witness statements that I took, and then because I was in a coma for five weeks, they've lost them. When I woke up, there were, the police had lost the 15 witness statements. The police won't had no video footage of the thing. Does that not scare you, Dave, then? That- and the insurance people, when they checked out all the car for... Um, you know, because it was really written off, I rolled it mm. on the motorway, found five monitoring devices in it. Five. Bug I found times. one in my bedroom. The army found one in my bedroom. I found four in my house, one in my bedroom, right? Forget all the fucking gangster shit they're going to hear in the kitchen. They heard me having a wank. I'm like, that. <laughs> that to me. <laughs> Did they you play out? So does that not scare the shit out of you then, What am I supposed that? to do? Yes, it does. But what am I supposed to do? I'm asking you. What can I do if I know that they are bugging my home, my phone and my car. Now, I know that. Now, what do I do? Do you ever get worried? Do about? I not talk? Yeah, that they won't set you up? Of course they've set me up. Mm-hmm. Of course they've called me fucking crazy. Of course they've set me up. I'm just going to come down and say, there's going to be a Kia Charlie in the boot of my car. And I'm just going, he fit me up. I pay police when they tell me how they do it. Mm-hmm. They raid anyone's fucking... And what a judge says, if you go and say, that copper set me up, a judge says this, that police officer earns 28 grand a year. Where do you think he earned 35 grand to buy a Kia Charlie to set you up, Mr. Courtney? Where do you think he earned that? And you look an idiot and they go, right. But how they do it is if I raided your house last night and found five Kia Charlie, and by the time I got down to the police station, I went, I've just raided your house and found two Kia Charlie. No one says, there was five. No one in the world. There was five. There was five. Not one person. There's a Keir Charlie. On the way to my house in the morning, he rings his own police station, said, I've just seen Courtney going into his house, struggling with a bird with a gun. 
By the time he gets to work, they've already got the warrant to come and raid my, raid my house. He then comes round my house with the 12 of them, ain't said fuck all any of them, runs in, kicks the door down, goes, ah, and drops his gear, Charlie, wherever. The copper behind him picks it up and goes, I found it. I then call him a fucking fit up and he never. Mm-hmm. That's it. That is it, all of it. It's as simple as that. They walk around and pick dog ends up of someone that they can't nick. Just put it at the scene of a crime and then go and say, and check that, DNA that. Right, where was you at 2 o'clock in the morning? And you'll go, I was home in bed. And they go, can you prove it? And you'll go, no. Right, well, unless you can explain why your dog end got in that bedroom, you burgled the house. Yeah, do you think there's a lot of corruption in us? I don't think. Oh, no, I paid, I paid yeah. them for years and years. Is there many, any men inside the now doing big millions, sentences that, millions. that you know that's Mi- been set up? 40. What? 40 men have got life. For they've never done the, it. The, the I'm not saying they're good men, they've never done anything else, mm-hmm. but they've been done. Do you think it's because if you're in a life of crime, they know you've done certain things, but they can't catch you, so they just set of you up? Of course they do, yeah, it's spiteful. Them. Some of them do it just because they wanted to fuck you or a woman. Mm-hmm. And they go and put you in prison with 30 years. It's simple. It's simple. Yeah, it's scary. I've had people on right, my listen show. Listen to this. Listen to this. I'm, I, I can prove it. I can prove it. I know a friend of mine was going to do a job in Thamesmead. He made a Kia gear. He was going to go and rob the man with a gun when he turned up for it. So he was running down to the shop, buying more white stuff, more glucose, more of a, and he was putting it in, putting it in, shit it weighed a kilo. Right, exactly. So he's got all the receipts from the shop where he bought it. It is not cocaine. It is saccharine, sugar, bar carbon. Right, that's all it is. He's made it, wrapped it all up, gone on the, gone on the meat, and the men with the money got away. The police come along, caught him with the cocaine, yeah? But he's not worried he ain't real. And they sent it away to analyse, but he's not worried. And it came back 82% proof. <coughs> Fuck's sake. Now, they're fucked because the gun weren't real, they've turned up, the people with the money got away, and the cocaine ain't real. So they've got all that surveillance for fuck all. So what they've just done is, not I would say to my mate, pass that on the MOT. Oh, you're the doorman. When he comes in, let him in for nothing. Or when he comes in, kick his fucking head in. They do that and they go, make that 78%. And he goes, of course. And when he goes to call, and they're all sitting there at me, and he went, we've had it checked, it's 78%. You cannot, it's, not, it's against the law, you can't go. Oh, that's not right. Oh, and they go, so, he said, it's been checked in a stick. And they go, no, but who checked it? And they go, I'm not telling you who he was. And you go, hey, it's this. It's, <laughs> you can imagine, can't yeah. you? Right? I've just done three months on remand, not worried, so no one's coming home today. And they just went, no. There's no, you can't blame anyone. You can't go and have it checked again. It's just that that bloke said, no, it's 78. Mm-hmm. And he's got, all the, he's got all the things to prove what it is like that. Ten year. Is, um, you've been stabbed, shot, nose bitten off. What one was the worst? I'd like to have had none of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, broken heart hurts everything else, but I mean, the, the, getting your nose bit off hurt. That one's, yeah. you know, he's lying on top of me. And when he actually went, he was trying to headbutt his head, but he was holding my hands, we couldn't do nothing. And he leant up on me and went, sorry, Dave. And I was thinking, sorry. And he went, <laughs> and it was on my bone. It was on the bone. And I was just going, <laughs> and my mouth was filling out of water. And it was like an electric shock. You know when you touch an electric shock and you go, yeah. for about half a second, it was like that for about 30 seconds on my nose and I'm like, I'm going to die of, I can't breathe, my mouth's been up blood and I was like going, and I thought, I've got to put it out. And while his teeth was on my bone, either side, it was all right. So as I've pulled it out that way to there, when there was no bone in the middle, he just took all of that bit off. His, his teeth met and all of that, uh, that all come off. He went, where's my trumpet? And... and the thing and the pain of it got my hand out and as hard as I could with one finger, I pushed it into his eye and pulled him off me on the top and his eye came out on the, on, on the, on the little bits. And I know this is stupid. I know this sounds unreal, not gangstery. But when the eye actually came out on the stick, the first thing that came into my head was, I wonder if he can see behind him. I wonder if he can go like that. I, I don't know why I thought that. I was, like, I was hurting anyway and as I was breathing, because then now it was just a big hole there. It was horrific. I was breathing in, you got that head freeze, like an ice cream. I was going, ah, 
and, and when I, I got him off me like that, and then he stood up. And when I stood up, I could see clearly, but double. So I could see both of you sitting there, but it was clear. I could touch each one. There was no fuzzy bits around the edge. And I was like, wow. And you, you know when you squeeze a spot on your nose, it makes your tears water. An 18 stone skinhead fucking hurts, right? And he's hanging there. And I couldn't, my eyes were watering. And I couldn't see what one was real. And my nose just had a big hole there. Everyone was going. And I could see, it's like, wow. And then it, yeah. and it went on and on and went on again. And he put in the lobe of my, you know, it was awful. Never fight a man before dinner time. There's, um, you speak about heartbreak as well, Dave, even though you've got the persona as the big, loud, bubbly man, we all struggle in life, no matter how tough you are, even the toughest men have become the weakest. Do you look back in life sometimes as well and wish you could have changed a few things? Oh, I'd really love to say no. Well, because there's not a lot of things I've changed because the bad things that happen to you, they're the things that learn you in life, the things that actually hurt you. Losing that boxing match will help. Anthony Joshua more than all the ones he's won. I believe so. Yeah. And things like that, you know, getting hurt, going to prison, although it's horrible, any day I wanted to go up, said, you want to go home? I'd have gone, yeah. What I learned from going there stopped me ever going back again. So you learn from being hurt. But the hurt I got from um, when, when you lose a wife and a child, yeah, I lost a child that was murdered and seven weeks after it, me and, me and the wife were at such loggerheads, we split up. That is, uh, I'd change that. Criminal-wise, because I haven't got big scars down my face. I haven't done 25 years in prison. I haven't got bullet holes. I'm not on the run. My front door's open, my back gate's open. You know, because I, I could say I wouldn't change anything crime-wise. Even the ones I got caught, I never got loads of burden. And it taught me everything and I've met. You know, so I can see the good in it because I'm now old. I can see the, the long-term value of it. So there's a few things I would have changed, but I'm afraid it would it would be more heart things because that affects yeah. a man. Family you know? things. A man, any man in the world has a bad day right, at work. Window cleaning, the windows fall out. Football, you get an own goal. You know, everyone has a bad day. As a criminal, you have a bad day, you go to prison. So you have to try and have as many fucking least of bad days as possible. And how you do that is you make sure you're all right with your missus every day. I'm telling you a fucking coup. Make sure that you and her are cool every day. And then and once you two are all right every day, at least every night, make sure you put your cock in her. <laughs> even if you don't like her. Even if you don't like her. Do that every fucking night. Do it every night. Even so it becomes habit. Do it. Even in two minutes. Do it. One minute right. for some people, Dave. <laughs> well, I'm just telling you, and because if you ever get, get the ump with her, they're the days you have bad days. When you're arguing with her and on the phone going, you can't you fucking fuck you too. Go, bum shut the door. Then you're driving off, going to work. Driving past roads you're meant to go down. Fucking doing all that on the phone when you're talking to her. I forget that. You don't need any of them as a criminal. You're going to get nicked that day, put away, and the last day you was with your missus, you was arguing. You need to be tight. You don't want to be going, oh, don't leave me. You know, you don't need all. Mm -hmm. So that's your most important thing. Get get her straight and then you can go out and fight the old world sometimes. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that romantically. I could fucking kick them up the arse too, but your own old woman. Need a backbone. Yeah. Keep that one at me and the rest of the world, you can nearly beat them all sometimes. Yeah. So going forward for the future for you, Dave, what's your plans? What's Dave Courtney's plans? I'm going for world domination. Um, <laughs> I actually fancy my chances against Anthony Joshua now, to be mm -hmm. quite honest. Uh, yeah. I'm doing a bit of training. I've done a sit-up the other day. <laughs> <laughs> Try to do a burpee. <laughs> um, but listen, I've, I've gone into the entertainment world and it was all going beautiful. You know, they based lock stock on myself and I've made my own film. I've made records. I've done... Uh, they've stopped me going to America now because they nicked me for... Um, a bullet. If you go out my ass, you've seen all them bullets. Oh, for fuck's sake, right. Well, they're like... not real. They've searched them for 20 so fucking years. So you see. <laughs> right, right. So they've said they found a real bullet in here. Stop me going to America. Um, I intend to go into the entertainment world. Yeah, I'm a better entertainer than I am gangster. Mm -hmm. I'm a better explainer of what the life's about than being involved in it now because I wouldn't want to be. It frightened me. The whole drug thing ain't. The, the violence, like, all of it is just not what it was when I was. I'd be no good at it. Have you ever done comedy, Dave? Yeah, yeah, comedy. Stand up. Yeah, yeah, very much. I do after dinner speaking all around the world. Mm -hmm. um, I do a lot of voiceovers for documentaries. 
I help a lot of other people out with their books. I do books. Many I'm books if you did, sorry? I've done nine, but I'm in them halfway through two at the moment. Which mm-hmm. One is a easy one, a newspaper article on that side, and then a couple of pages about that. Newspaper article, and the rest are autobiographical. And I'm going to bring another one of them out called, Do You Remember That Day? Because everyone that comes around, although I don't see them a lot, they've had one day with us where they go, oh, it might have been 20 years ago. And they always come around and go, oh, do you remember that day? That's how it starts, mm-hmm. a load of stories. So I see I ain't got structure for the book. I just want to do a load of stories that you would never Short hear. Short stories. I'm going to do it, remember that day. Yeah. Any yeah. documentaries do you think you have planned for I'm halfway through one at the moment. Yeah, there's a few. There's one done and they, they're selling it to Netflix. There's another one nearly done and then something happened where one of us has got nicked and they've had to stop. Uh, where are they now? Mm-hmm. You know. Who would you love to do a documentary on what crime family, a crime figure, or underworld boss would you love to have done a documentary on, tell their story? There's a load more entertaining criminals and hard men than anyone knows, that no one knows the name of. When you say, who's your hardest bloke you know, it's mm-hmm. out of... Lenny McLean and Roy Shaw. I know people that kick fuck out both of them. I know prettier girls than Miss World. I know better fucks than Madonna. I know a better singer than Pixie Lot down mm-hmm. the floor. Yeah, we all do. We know funnier blokes as a, as a lighting technician than any comedy bloke you could ever meet. You understand mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. but I've got some. I've got some. Um, I've got some people that you're just gonna go and follow someone around. Mm-hmm. I've got some working girls that are the funniest women you'll ever meet in your life. And the hard nut that he's got driving her around looking after him, you know, he's looking after three prostitutes at a time, dropping her off and waiting there. Their stories are the funniest. She is the most stunning looking, beautiful creature you have ever seen in your life. Looks like it walks off the front of a magazine. 19 years old, comes from Croatia or something. It's just, it's like Pocahontas with a strap on on. It's fucking stunning. It's, you know. <laughs> But they're, 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 I'd, I'd have, I'd, I'd get you some pickpockets, some working girls, some car oh. thieves, you know, people with blinding stories, with bank stories robbers. and backgrounds. And- bank robbers that will, you know, the fact you rob a bank for a job doesn't necessarily make you an horrible person. Crime. Yeah, you just do that as a job. You understand me? Don't, prostitutes don't come home and fuck all their neighbours and bricklayers don't run home with a trowel in the front room and I don't run around with a gun going, my big pig cheese sandwich. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. tools of the trade on site, go work. And when you come home, you're just a bloke. Mm-hmm. No matter what uniform you have on at work, they're in charge. She's in charge, isn't it? You're just yeah. a bloke. Because right. you, I've seen you at the I was doing an, I was doing interviews for the Porn Awards. I was interviewing all the winners and I've seen you yeah. floating about a few times. Yeah. You're very well respected and about all the awards. Do you love all that? How much do you love like clearly you've got a fucking sex dungeon and how much do you love all the, the girl stuff, the orgies and you still and I've had it all my life. I suppose I am mellowing a bit now. But it'd be an odd person to go and find a lover for or a normal everyday wife, isn't it? You know, I have I have a two or threes up a couple of times a week. There's orgies going on here. There's a swinging fetish party Friday where there's everyone be shaking everyone in here. And that's you fucking steadying the ship as well. well. well you know, <laughs> How bad was your wild days, Steve? Oh, I don't want to talk about it because I've come over as some kind of nonce. <laughs> but that worked, yeah? You know, that worked. You know, like, my job was looking after eight porn stars that went to Hollywood for eight weeks to see if they could crack it. And my job was in a Winnebago looking after them. I'm like, is this for real? Is this really and truly? And then what was what was a nightmare of that was while I was out there, I made a blue a blade blue for a, a porn film, took the age test, done it, and they went, We guarantee you, Davey, we guarantee you this film will never be seen out of it. He went, because we're selling it to a hotel chain ring and it's only going to be showed in North America. You can't tape this film off of the hotel porn, right? You can't tape it off, so it'll only ever be showed out here. I forgot it. Two years later I'm in fucking Vegas with my <laughs> at someone else's wedding she went ain't it beautiful we paid the money and I was getting married in the morning so I've completely forgot two years ago I don't know what hotel they're going to put me in for the mm-hmm. right? so I got married in the morning and in the afternoon while we're in the hotel suite and she stuck the porn on lying on the old vibrating round <laughs> bed with a smear on come her old man <laughs> <laughs> No No wonder your fucking heart was all falling to pieces, man. Do you look back in your life, Davey, and and go, 
Yeah, it's been fucking wild. It's oh, crazy. Yeah, I've had heart really do. And everyone keeps telling me, if I was to drop down dead with anything that goes wrong with me, heart attack and all, everyone goes, be careful. At least I can say genuinely, and everyone going, I have had five lives in my life. Mm. I genuinely can. If I had someone go behind me, I can smile it. Right? Mm. As I feel myself going through the windscreen and the crash, crash, I don't mind. Because I know I, no one could have fucked as many, as many have been around the world. You know, and I haven't had to be horrible, nasty. There's everyone else is going super gangster. There's no one round here that you know that knows me has ever said it. I've heard I'm a grass. No one's ever said it to me, ever. I've seen it on, on, the, on the thumb talking. Never. Mm. It's, just, it's just, I've had a mental little, mental little life. Pl- Men- mental little life. Still plenty more to come. How can people watch your, um, buy your books, Dave? How can people get them? I think they're all on Amazon. My new ones are going to be coming out in Waterstones and all that. I'm going to go around and do a bit of um, uh, publicising them myself. But um, you can get them on Amazon. You can get all the DVDs on Amazon. I've got a website, I've got a Facebook site you can go and check out. Mm-hmm. I'll go around the world doing shows. Um, I'll actually keep everyone informed on the, on the internet, which I'm not really up on. Obviously, you know, that's social media does stuff. My yeah. thing for me. I do it to people. I help everyone down here do all their music videos. They want bits in a film. I don't charge them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not for me to be in the fucking thing. If they want to end, grab it. Because I know how mm-hmm. what a touch it is when you're trying for someone to go, I'll lend you my house. Yeah. I'll do it for you for an hour. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you've let us yeah. in your house and you've made us feel so welcome. You showed us a few things that I've never seen. That's because I've got Brendan before. outside robbing your car. <laughs> <laughs> he's, got a, he's got a nice black sexy murk out Run. <laughs> You actually look like you should be. As soon as that comes down the road, everyone at the top of the road goes, they're visiting Courtney. <laughs> I guess by the haircuts, you're bald, sir. Love your haircut, love it, by the way. Right? And you draw a black murk. It's just so Dave Courtney, you're only going to see one person. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Dave, for letting us into your home and giving the time, so I know you're a busy man, and giving us the time to speak and come on my show. I really cool, appreciate man, that. And your story's unbelievable. Yeah, and mate. all the best for the future. If um, you get the good, if you get a good, um, if you get as many clicks as you like, I don't mind doing it for you again. Yeah, pre- yeah, we will, and I appreciate that.